Well, good evening again, everyone. So tonight we're going to continue in John 17, verse 13. We left off at verse 12. This is the night, last night of Christ's physical life. Uh, he had finished the Passover with the disciples in chapter 14, 15, 16. And then in 17, we have recorded uh, the only full prayer of Jesus Christ as he prays to the Father. And um, as it seems, the disciples either heard this or John was inspired by God to record it later. Um, I suspect he was praying this out loud to also strengthen the disciples during this time. And it's a very intimate prayer. Um, Christ asking for the Father to restore him to the glory that he had. And the, the trust that went both ways in this is just really something to consider because Christ divested himself of his glory, which meant he was truly human. There were a lot of theories, a lot of teachings over the centuries that he was not truly physical. Uh, you've got dualistic teachings that say spirit can't dwell with physical because spirit's holy, physical is excuse me, physical is evil. And so you have this phantom, this spirit ghost. That's why it uses the expression Holy Ghost in some translations. It wasn't really human, but if he wasn't really human, how did he die? And so then you have those that parse even the name that Jesus was the physical being. Christ lived in him and it was Jesus that died, not Christ, which then sets up a whole nother problem with doctrinal understanding in terms of his death, his sacrifice, uh, the prophecies being fulfilled about being three days and three nights in the grave, all of these things. It's just straightforward if we accept that he became human and that he took on our sin payment with his life. He truly died. He knows this is what's approaching. And the father, even during this time, was completely alone in terms of an equal. And, and so it's both of them in this relationship, Christ is expressing his desire to be unified with him again. So let's pick it up in verse 13 again, John 17. Christ then says here, but now I come to you, speaking to the Father, and I say these things in the world that they may have my joy made full in themselves. I've given them your word. And in verse 17, you see my little line there. God's word is truth. He's given us truth. Uh, Paul elaborates on this, even in 1 Corinthians, the study that we're going through there, where he talks about this not being, you know, cunning fables of men or, you know, the power of someone who is charismatic or very um, convincing or moving in terms of oratory skills. You know, it's truth. It is. It exists. It, it's not compromised. And so he says, I've given them your word. The world hated them because they're not of this world, even if as I am not of this world. That is, we are not under the system of the world. God has called us out. We're even in um, Galatians, talks about us being adopted. Christ bought us back with his blood. The Father now sees us as his children because he's imparted his spirit in us, exactly how he did with Christ. We are begotten, not fully born yet, but begotten as children. We are children. The birth, if you will, will come when we're made truly spirit, fully spirit. So he says the world hated them because they're not of this. We will, I'm convinced, stand out increasingly in the, in the end time, even without preaching God's word. Just because we're living it, they're going to see that we're not of the world. We're not going to embrace what they embrace. We're not going to validate what they validate. We're not going to use their language their values, all of these things. And so we will stand out and they're going to hate us for it. Verse 15, I do not pray that you would take them from the world, but that you would keep them from the evil war, uh, evil one, excuse me. So um, we can look at this two ways, in, in a general sense or in a specific sense. That is, God has left us in this physical world, but he promises to keep us from the evil. Now, it doesn't mean we won't have trials and tribulations, but we're not subject to the same things the world is subject to. 
we're recipients of God's grace, as was said in the prayer even. And that grace is reciprocal. As we draw close to God, he draws close to us. And as we obey him, then he shows us more favor. He's not playing favorites. It's simply that he's working with us now. He'll do the same for the rest of the world later when it's their time. So he says that you would, that they would, excuse me, that we would be kept from the evil or evil one. Evil in general, evil specifically, Satan, his demonic realm. Verse 16, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. That is, because we are begotten of God now, we no longer serve that world. We serve God. So verse 17, sanctify them through your truth. The word sanctified means to set apart for a holy purpose. And so we're sanctified through God's word. Verse 14, that truth, we're set apart, we're made holy because God's spirit works in us as we apply that truth in our life with God's help. Again, your word is truth. Um, and the word sanctify there is from the Greek, hagiazo. So verse 18, as you sent me into the world, even so I've sent them into the world. Originally, the apostles were the ones sent forth. That's what that title, that word means, be sent forth. We know that they were sent to what was called the lost sheep of Israel, not the lost tribes. They were still known. You can go to James 1, where he, he specifically addresses his letter to the tribes. They knew where those tribes were. Um, and so the apostles were each sent to one of those tribes to teach, uh, to teach preach the gospel message, um, to baptize as God called, all of those things, but to send forth, to speak the message they were given, much like Christ was by the Father, as he said at the beginning of verse 18 there. Verse 19, for their sakes, for the disciples, but by extension, even us, for their sakes, I sanctify myself, made himself holy, he made himself holy by allowing God's spirit to work his will in Christ. He became set apart, not just for us as a Passover sacrifice, not just to come preach the gospel message, but to sanctify himself that he could do even more. So he says, I sanctified myself that they may themselves also be sanctified in truth. Not only for these do I pray, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. And that's us. That's everyone down from the first century on um, that has opportunity, has had opportunity to hear the gospel message, to read God's word. Um, so that's us. We read it in our Bibles. You know, Paul and Peter and James and John and Luke and Matthew and so forth. They all recorded these messages, these um, inspirations from God for us to be sanctified in that word, in that truth. Verse 21, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. So um, we'll come to, to this aspect of unity in verse 23 a little bit more, but let's look at those verses there. I have 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, Paul writes, For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. That unity that the Father and the Son have, we are to have in them and with each other. That unity of purpose, of mind, of action. Uh, Paul spends, again, a great deal of time in 1 Corinthians talking about division talking against division. And Christ and the Father were never divided, never. Satan tried to divide them. That's Matthew 4, when he put all these things out to Christ. You know, if you fall down and worship me, I'll give you rulership over all these kingdoms. It was Satan's to give. But to think that the Son of God, the one who had created Satan, would bow to him, um, just shows how twisted his mind is there. He wasn't unified at all, but hoping to create a wedge between the Father and the Son. Because if Christ had not fulfilled the reason for him coming, then the plan of salvation is done. There, There is no more opportunity. But because he did 
fulfill what he came to do, we have great hope. And this unity that they have is what we should have. So again, verse 21, that they may also be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, that they'll see God through us. Years ago in the Worldwide Church of God, for those of you who remember that history, Mr. Armstrong at one point, I believe it was in um, the late 70s, might have been the early 80s, commissioned a study because he had realized that even though the numbers were growing almost exponentially in terms of attendance and membership, uh, he realized there were a lot of people that had left over the course of the decades. And so he wanted to know how many. And the conclusion of the study was that as many people had left as compared to who can, uh, at that point attended. So the same number that attended was the same number that left over the decades. And that's why he made the comment that he made regularly towards the end of his life where he said, half of you don't get it. Because he realized that if half had already left, that half would probably leave again. And this is this comes back to this matter of unity. We weren't really unified, were we? We weren't unified with each other. The problems that existed within the church, we weren't unified with the Father and the Son. Otherwise, you wouldn't have had so many leave the faith. And I think this is something that God is impressing upon his church more and more and more. This need to be unified. Because if we're not unified, we don't learn to become like God. We can learn to act like God, but we don't learn to become like God until we're unified with him and with each other. And the whole purpose of that unity is because we will be in his family. And that's what Paul talks about here in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. We're baptized into that body, not bodies, body. There's only one temple. There's only one body of Christ. Right now, there may be different aspects of God's church scattered around with different leaders or organizations. That's not to our credit. But it is the reality. God will sort that out in the way that he knows best. But we're baptized into this spirit, and God is not divided. Unified is what he's talking about here. Verse 22, the glory which you have given me, I have given to them. We don't tend to think of ourselves as having God's glory. But if Christ lives in us, how could we not? That glory is not ours, but we have a responsibility like a steward to treat it with respect and use it wisely. It's, it's given from the Father and the Son to become more like him. So he says, I've given to them that they may be one, even as we are one. And so verse 23, I and them, you and me, that they may be perfected in one, that the world may know that you have sent me and love them even as you loved me. This matter of perfected is not talking about lack of error, making mistakes. The Greek there has the meaning of perfectly unified. So perfectly one. So I and them, you and me, that they may be perfectly one as he just asked up in the earlier verses, that we would be unified with him as he and the Father are unified, and we would be unified in that same unity with each other, that we may be perfectly one, that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me, that they will again see the Father through us, our actions, our deeds, our words, how we treat one another. The old proverb is that, you know, I'd rather see a sermon every day than to hear one preached. People look at our actions. This is notable when we go to some of these areas for fee sites, especially if it's a smaller community. Our presence makes quite an impact. People are impressed with how we behave, how our children behave, how respectful we are, how we take care of things. Well, that's just one aspect of this. Do they see even beyond that to what we teach? Some may. Most probably won't because they don't have God's spirit, but they'll recognize that it's different. And right now, they'll at least respect that. But that difference, as we read back up in verse 14, will later cause the world to hate us because through those actions, they're going to see that we condemn, to use the biblical term, we condemn the world and its systems. We condemn it because it doesn't work, like Noah's actions condemned the pre-flood world. 
he didn't have to judge them. He didn't have to verbally renounce them. Just simply by what he was preaching and how he was living, they took exception with it because it showed what they were doing wasn't proper. I think most of the world knows they're not living the right life, but they don't know any better. And what else do you do? Without God's spirit, they, they don't know where to turn, so they keep chasing things. Unfortunately, with human nature, we chase the more base and the more base and the more base to the point where there are no standards or values. We're seeing that even erode in this country. But through this perfection, this unity, that they'll see that God loves us and the love that we have for each other. Verse 24, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am, that they may see my glory, which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. Now, this is obviously not a reality in the sense that we're literally with Christ where he is, but we're with Christ where he is when we keep his teachings, when we practice what he told us to do, when we're unified in, in the way that he's talking about here. Um, we're with him because he lives in us. This matter of before the foundation of the world goes to uh, Revelation, where that it says that he was slain before the world, that they, at some point in prehistory, whatever that was, they had a conversation, if you will, about how they would bring others into their family. And we see what that plan was now. They created the universe, and they specifically created this planet to host life that's on such a razor's edge with all kinds of things. How far we are from the sun is perfectly tuned for life, not too hot, not too cold. Our planet tilts at the right angle to have seasons, so most of the surface of the planet is habitable. You know, the fact that food will grow, the right kind of food, you know, that we don't have animals that are going to destroy us. Um, even our solar system helps to protect us from asteroids coming in from other parts of the universe, the destruction that took place before Genesis 1, all of these things. This, this was all planned ahead of time. This is, none of this is an accident. None of this is an afterthought. You know, Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve chose poorly, <laughs> to use the movie term, um, it didn't. It didn't upend God's plan. If the Lamb was slain for the before the foundation of the world, they knew that mankind, without God's Spirit, with having free will, would make wrong choices. But they had to allow for that to create character. But in allowing for that, they didn't allow that it would just go off kilter and it could never be accomplished. Their plan that if the one that we know as Christ came, died as a sinless sacrifice, a perfect sinless sacrifice, that his blood could redeem us, buy us back, and that through God's spirit, we could learn to become like him and come into his family. All of that was decided before anything was created. Verse 25, righteous father, the world hasn't known you, but I knew you. Part of why Christ came was to reveal the father because even the Jews had lost that knowledge. There is evidence in the writings going back to 300 BC or earlier. They understood a, a dual aspect of the Godhead, if you will. They didn't know them as the Father and the Son, but they knew there were two. But by the first century, by that time it came along, they had moved to a strict monotheistic teaching. This is why they took such umbrage when, when Christ said, I am. We'll come to that um, in the next chapter. They wanted, that was part of why they wanted to kill him, because they saw that as blasphemy, that he was making himself equal with God. Well, like the old TV series back in the 60s said, you know, it's no brag, it's just fact. That they couldn't wrap their head around the fact that it, that it could be true. <laughs> and because they couldn't, then they dismissed so much other understanding. So they didn't know the Father. And Christ revealed the Father through all that he did. He even told his disciples, you know, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Because that oneness, where did where does one end and the other begin? This is this is what a, a godly marriage should represent. You see that unity come into play over a lifetime. To think as one, to act as one, to be so unified in everything that's done. Family is not designed to be in conflict. 
it's designed to, to represent, to reflect the Godhead. We read that in Ephesians 5. So he says, verse 25 again, the world hasn't known you, but I knew you, and these knew that you sent me. Took them a while to get up to speed, but they recognized it. Even earlier, we covered that. They said, now we know you are the Son of God. Verse 26, I made known to them your name and will make it known that the love with which you love me be, may be in them and I in them. So we see in Christ too this true submission. It's not a forsaking of who he is, but rather a desire to serve. And so Christ took everything back to the Father. He said, I'm, I didn't come to do my will. I came to do the will of the Father. And we should too, to do his will, his purpose. That's hard for us as Americans to do because we it's been ingrained in our culture that we're independent, with that we answer to no one. And so we see this reflected in divorce rates. We see it reflected in even people that don't even bother to get married. We see it in a, in a lack of investment, I guess is the best word I can think of, in relationships in general. But nothing is more important than our relationship with the Father and the Son. If we went back up to verse 3, we would see that um, this John 17, verse 3, this is eternal life that they should know you, the only true God in him who you sent. We know eternal life through the Father and the Son. We have opportunity to have eternal life through the Father and the Son. And that's the unity that he's talking about here. All right, so chapter 17, now we move down to chapter 18. And here um, he agonizes in further prayer in Gethsemane. Now, I don't know that you can see this map very well, but this is a map of Jerusalem. The Antonio Fortress is here. That was on the northwest corner of the temple complex. The temple is right in here. And so then you have the wall around Jerusalem. And um, Gethsemane was just across the Kidron Valley, um, just north of the east entrance to the temple complex. So it wasn't very far. It was a, a short walk, a couple of tenths of a mile. And as we'll see, this is a place that Jesus tended to go to on a regular basis. Um, so let's read the account in, um, well, let's read Mark's account just for a little bit of a change here. Mark 14, verse 32 then. So they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And Gethsemane means oil press. And this seems to have been an olive garden, if you will, a grove, certainly a lot of olive trees. Some of the commentaries and historians talk about the reason for this was to have a source close to the temple for all the oil that was needed. That it could have been easily harvested, pressed, and put in the supplies of the temple without much uh, effort for transport and all of those things. So he's at Gethsemane and he says to his disciples, sit here while I pray. Now we're told in John's account, if we had continued there, that this it was across the Kidron Valley. So this is part of why we know where it is. So going back to Mark 14, verse 33, after asking them to stay there while he went off a little further to pray, he said he took Peter, James, and John with him. These were, I, I hate to use the term inner circle. It's not that he excluded the other ones, but these were men that he seemed to be training more directly. James was, as we know, seemed to know, the first martyr of the of the eleven, and then later the twelve. Um, in fact, mentioned the only one mentioned in scripture specifically dying um, as a martyr. Uh, Peter died somewhere around sixty five A.D. John, of course, we're not quite sure of the date, but it was probably ninety eight, ninety nine A.D. towards the end of the first century. All three were used uh, in a great way. But these are the ones that went with him. And it says he began to be greatly troubled and distressed. Um, think of this from a human perspective. Nobody wants to die. And nobody wants to die knowing that they'll suffering the way someone died 
and suffered with crucifixion. So it's not that he is going to refuse to do this. It's just, this is a big thing and he's not done yet. He's, he has to see this through to the end to be that perfect sinless sacrifice for our sin payment. And so everything is coming down to the wire. Everything's coming to a head and he knows it. And there's great stress here. There's just no setting that aside. Uh, Matthew's account, Matthew 26, 38 says, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful. I mean, he's just, I don't want to say burden because he said it wasn't a burden. It was joy that he came to do this. But just again, how this would weigh on anybody, the responsibility to make sure you don't stumble at the finish line, to make sure you finish the work given to you, all of these things, because he knows what comes from this. Verse 35, going back to Mark 14. Well, before we do that, let's go to Isaiah 53 there. So Mark 14, verse 34 I have a reference there for Isaiah 53, verse 3. So Isaiah 53, verse 3 says, He is despised and rejected of men. This is a prophecy of Christ. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Now, as it says here in Matthew's account, he was very sorrowful. But think of also just all the other sorrow he saw. We all come across that from time to time in our lives, but... There was a lot of sorrow that came to Christ. The people that were diseased and sick, the people that were demon-possessed, the people that always wanted something from him. They wanted food or they wanted proof. You know, the Jewish authorities always pressing on him. You know, this, this sorrow that was around him. And I don't want to make it sound like he was just always fighting this depression or just burden, but it was always there. This is, I, I'm convinced, why he spent so much time in prayer. He had to counter that with something better. And having that connection back to, to the fathers, we read in chapter 17, to be reminded of that unity and that oneness that they had, that's where he drew his strength from. So Isaiah 53, to continue here, verse 3, it says, A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. And he's even going to face more sorrow, isn't he? In spite of telling them that they would scatter, in spite of telling Peter that he would deny him three times before the rooster crowed, in spite of the three and a half years of living with these men, teaching them, guiding them, they all scattered, didn't they? John came back, it seems, at some point towards the end. Peter was off in a distance from afar because Christ looked him in the eye. He's hanging on the cross there. The rooster crows, and he looks at Peter. And I can only imagine what Peter felt like. But even in that, even though he knew his connection with his father, even though he knew what was following afterwards, even though he knew the great purpose and, and all that it would bring in a positive way, to have your friends walk away at a time like this, you can't help but feel that. So going back to Mark 14 and verse 35. So he went forward a little. This is in the garden. He went forward, he fell on the ground and prayed there. If it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He knew it wasn't, but still he's asking if there's any other way. So Luke's account says about a stone's throw. You know, what is that? 20 yards or so, maybe, maybe not even that far. But he didn't want to die any more than anyone else would want to die. But he knew that it needed to be. He's just having the conversation, if you will, with the Father. And so verse 36, he says, Abba, Father, all things are possible to you. I, I know there's an, if you wanted it, there's another way this could be done. Please remove this cup from me. However, and this is the salient point. However, not what I desire, but what you desire. It's not about our comfort. There, there are times God will give us great blessings that will enrich our lives, but that's not why he called us. That's the wealth and, and health gospel. He promised that it would be hard, that Satan would press against us. He even told Peter, Satan wants to sift you like flour, and that's not in a good way. He wanted to sift him out of God's plan. 
So it's not about having the best and the comfort now. Look how many in Hebrews 11 died in the faith. Not just of old age. You know, they were stoned, they were burned, they were cut in two, you know, just all these things. So he said, but that's, as much as I don't want to go through this, I want what you want. What you desire. The word Abba is Aramaic. It's not Greek. And it's, it's just um, the actual word here. It's not translated into Greek. And so Abba is a term of affection. In English, it would be similar to saying daddy or, you know, a, a term of affection like papa, things of that nature, not more formal like father. So this is the relationship he has. So as the note I have off to the side there, total submission to the father is what Christ is showing here. He's expressing his will, his, his desire, but he tempers that with no matter what I say, I want it to be your will that's done. And so again, he's he's struggling on a human level with this. But he knows it needs to be done. And so he's following through. So we're going to move to Luke's account here. So Luke uh, 22 and verse 43. It says, an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. So even in this, the father didn't leave him alone. He sent, the father sent an angel to strengthen him. Just the presence probably did a lot to, to give him courage, if you will. Maybe there was something said, a, a word, a message from the father. Uh, maybe just there to sit next to him, to be there with him, just as a sign of support. We don't know. But God sent this angel and it strengthened him. We know angels are ministering servants. And it's comforting on some level that even Christ needed to be comforted. <laughs> that even Christ needed to be served. Now he said earlier, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. But in this moment, he needed to be served. Because as I said a little while ago, this all comes down to him finishing the responsibility, the reason for coming in the flesh. This had to succeed. Now, there wasn't that there was a question it wouldn't. But again, from a human perspective, he needed the strength to see it through. And there's even a lesson there for us. In the worst of circumstances, in the worst of trials and tribulations, that if we ask God to give us his strength to do his will, he will supply the need. He will give us what is needed. So verse 44, Luke 22, being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. His sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. And for some centuries, it was thought that this was just too fantastic to even be a reality. But modern science shows that this is indeed possible. Under times of great distress, a person can actually rupture the capillaries under the surface of the skin, and you can it'll look like they sweat blood. This is the stress that he's under. Now, one of the questions I had was, what is it that's notable about these two, two verses? Luke 22, verses 43 and 44. For some reason, and this, this, I, I know the reason, but it, it's just, anyway, let me finish my thought. For the the Many historians, the theologians specifically, uh, commentaries, they'll talk about these two verses being suspect. That is, that they may not have been in the original manuscripts. Now, they're in the Byzantine manuscripts, which is what the King James was originally translated from, Young's Literal, New King James, what I have in this harmony here is what's called the World English Bible. That's a recent translation of, uh, I think, about three years ago. They also use the Byzantine, but more specifically, what's called the Textus Recepta, the received texts, the New King James, or the sorry, the King James used. There are so many other manuscripts that have come to light in the last um, 400 years that most theologians believed that the older a manuscript was, and that is if they could carbon date it or date it in some other way, that if it was older, meaning closer to the time of Christ, that made it more accurate. 
because another thought that developed over the centuries by critics was that the Bible had been subtly moved, if you will, that things had been inserted, things had been removed, um, that the meaning, if there was any in the original text, had sort of drifted over the centuries. And that was why the Dead Sea Scrolls were such a phenomenal find, because it showed going back to within less than 100 years of the time of Christ, that the Old Testament was preserved almost exactly the way we have it today. The difference is just a few words, if you will, in the scheme of things. So we have no other, we should have no other doubt with the New Testament that it was preserved as accurately because God wanted it to be. So they think these are suspect because these verses are in some of what's called the Alexandrian manuscripts, which came mostly out of Alexandria, Egypt. But what's interesting is not all, and this is the problem I have with the Alexandrian manuscripts, not all of the Alexandrian manuscripts agree with each other. There's great difference between them. And you have some early, what, what they call church fathers. If you ever hear the term church fathers, don't think New Testament following the instruction of Christ. Think second, third, and fourth century early aspects of what we know today as Catholicism. That, that's what the church fathers are. So we're talking like Augustus, and we're talking um, Eusebius, and we're, we're talking Clement of Rome, and we're talking some of these other fellows that began to incorporate pagan or Greek thoughts or others. So they wrote, some of those early father, church fathers, they wrote um, in some commentary that they did, that this was in some of those Byzantine, or excuse me, Alexandrian manuscripts. So that's why there's doubt here. I don't doubt that it's uh, inspired. It's there because God wanted it to. He had Luke record it. Um, we don't know also if it was only the disciples with him at this point. And we'll see that in the next section because it talks about a multitude being with Christ and a multitude coming out to, to take him. Now, Luke recorded a lot of what he recorded because he was not the original disciples, apostles. It seemed he came to the story later and it seems that he interviewed Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ. And it could be that if Mary was there, this is just pure speculation, take it for what it's worth, Mary would have seen this, or perhaps somebody else would have seen it that Luke could have interviewed, if you will. And that's why Luke includes it when none of the other gospel accounts do. That's not necessarily a sign that it's a problematic section, <laughs> but some commentaries, some theologians do that. They look at it and say, well, that makes it suspect, but Luke was inspired to record what he did, and the value of the four different gospel accounts is that at times they all recorded something different. I mean, John 14, 15, 16, 17, none of the other writers recorded any of that. Why not? Well, they were focused on other things. Each of those books have a different audience, if you will, and so they're going to note different things. They're going to highlight different things, and this simply is what Luke highlighted. So um, let's continue on then in Matthew's account. So let me scroll down here. Matthew 26 and verse 40. It says, he came to the disciples, Christ. He had gone to the Gethsemane. He asked them to wait. He was going to go a little bit further and pray. He finished praying. He comes back. This is verse 40, Matthew 26. He came to the disciples and found them sleeping. Now, it's easy for us to criticize them. How could you at this time? But they're under a lot of stress, too, here. And what we find is, humanly, what we find is that when we're under stress, we get tired, don't we? When people go through very traumatic events, you know, even, even just the death of a loved one, but certainly in war, in great natural catastrophes, things of this nature, afterwards, People just need to sleep. Their body has just been so stressed. They, they need a time out, if you will. 
Um, in Luke's account, Luke 22, verse 45, it says that they were sleeping because of grief, which seems counterintuitive. But again, anybody that's been through that, you know how draining emotionally those times are when someone dies. And here, they know what's coming. He's told them what's coming. They've seen crucifixions. And they're already grieving. So they're exhausted. So he finds them asleep. Going back to Matthew's account. Matthew 26, verse 41. Watch and pray. The word watch there means to stay awake, which is fitting with what he's saying. But it more specifically means to take heed to not be caught off guard. So he's saying pay attention so that you're not caught off guard. We're caught off guard when we think we're okay, when, when we're relying on our strength, when we're not as close to God as we need to be, when we're not as unified as we need to be. And then things happen and we, we're like stunned. Where did that come from? Well, this is what he's saying. Pay attention. So those things, that doesn't happen. Because if it does, notice one of the very first things that comes from it. Watch and pray that you don't enter into temptation. Satan can use those times of distraction to put things in front of us we might not otherwise consider. But in those moments of stress, we can allow ourselves to accept. So he says, pay attention. So you don't enter into temptation. Because he says, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. This is Romans 7, isn't it? This is this was what Paul was writing about. And the interesting thing about Romans 7 is that Paul was writing that roughly 25 years or so after Acts 9, after his conversion. So 25 years down the road, he's saying, I, I know what to do. In my mind, I know what to do, but my body... It's the sin that does, that, that comes out. And so this is the battle. This is the staying awake. This is the not entering to temptation. This is the unity with the Father and the Son and with each other. This is making sure the spirit is willing and the flesh is as well. Because we're battling against that. But that's also why we're first fruits. That's why we're going to have the greater reward. Not salvation. That's the parable of the workers in the vineyard everybody gets salvation in the end that wants it and works for it the difference is the reward and the reward for the first fruits are that they're the bride of christ they serve directly under jesus christ to serve the rest of mankind and so we're working against the flesh we're work that's self we're working against satan we're working against society that that society that's going to hate us that's going to take work that's going to we're going to have to watch and pray because it's going to get rough. But we can do it just like Christ did. We can do it if we stay close to the Father. So Matthew 26, 42, he's, again, a second time he went away. This is in Gethsemane again. So he goes off a distance again, not far away, but just off privately and he prayed, this is the second time. And he says, my father, if this cup can't pass away from me unless I drink it, your desire be done. He's still wrestling with this to make sure he's going to do the right thing. That if it's possible, he wants it to be some other way. But then again, he knows it's not possible. And he's asking to make sure God does it the right way and that he does it the right way. So he comes back and he finds them sleeping again. It says, for their eyes were heavy. But in Mark's account, Mark 14, verse 40, he seemed to ask them a question. Why are you sleeping? That's the inferred question because it says they didn't know what to answer him. So back to Matthew's account, Matthew 26, 44. So he left them again. This is the third time. He went away and prayed, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, sleep on now. Take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hand of sinners arise let's be going behold he who betrays me is at hand so i want to come back to that before i do though i want to highlight that gray box that you see up there because there are a number of sets of threes in the coming chapter and it's just interesting to note i don't put anything behind it it's just sometimes god does use numbers and sets and it's just worth making sure we pay attention to those and 
in no particular order there, but roughly chronologically, those are the ones that I highlighted. The three times he prayed before his death. It says here, he went away three times to do this. He took the three disciples with him, Peter, James, John. Three times he came back after praying. He found his disciples asleep. Later, shortly here, we will find that he told Peter three times, feed my sheep. And there's little nuances in there we'll cover when we get to that. There were three that were crucified together, right? Christ and two criminals. So three again. Three times he went before the civil authorities. Three times he went before the religious authorities. So the civil authorities were the Jewish authorities. So he went before Annas. He went before Caiaphas. He went before the Sanhedrin. Then he goes before Pilate. And then he goes to Herod and Antipas. And then he goes back to Pilate. So three times before the civil authorities. Three times before the religious authorities. And then, of course, three days and three nights in the grave. So just wanted to highlight that. You can see that as we go through it. But to go back to Matthew 26, verse 46, he says, He who betrays me is at hand. And I mentioned this earlier. How did Judas know where to find Christ? How did he know where to bring the Jewish authorities and where Christ would be so that he could kiss him, identify him like they didn't know who Christ was, but just to make sure Judas would kiss him, and they would seize him, and everything would proceed from there. Judas knew where Christ would be because he went to Gethsemane regularly. Like I said, it was just a short distance from the temple itself, not, not even half a mile. It would seem that he would regularly go there to have conversations with the disciples, to teach others. This, this was sort of a, a hangout, if you will. And so Judas had a really good idea where he was going to be, and that's where he comes. So rather than get into the next section with only a few minutes left, let's leave it there. But in the next Harmony study, we'll move into what Robertson calls part 13. So now we move from the end of Christ's ministry, and the end of it was teaching the New Testament symbols his prayer for unity, the things that we've covered tonight. Now we move into, next time, we'll move into the events that will transpire overnight on Tuesday, ABIB 14. So we're going to have the arrest, we're going to have the trial, we're going to have the crucifixion and the burial. That's the next section. But specifically, the, the, the part, next part we'll cover is when Jesus is betrayed and arrested. So we'll leave it there.